hope we're all awake and ready for a Bible study this morning that will be of value to each of us. My purpose is to begin a short stu series of studies on a theme that I think is long overdue, at least in this congregation. From my standpoint, I don't think that I've dealt with this a great deal. About a year or so ago, we looked at one question that is related that will come up again probably in the short series. And the question had to do with the relation of the church to Israel, the present day church to Israel. We looked at that some and we'll be involved in the things we'll talk about now. But as you can see indicated from the PowerPoint presentation, I'm asking about a question that so many people today are concerned about and you hear so much about. I suppose this is one of the most talked about themes in all of Christendom and maybe even in many other quarters outside of the church. A lot of people are talking about the question. You hear it said that very soon, soon the Lord is coming again. Some of our hymns, we have ideas like that that have creeped in to our very song books. Soon he's coming back to welcome me or far beyond the starry sky. We, we confidently affirm we know he's coming back soon. Our Lord is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Morning or night or noon. And one of the stanzas even says the signs of the time indicate that it's about to happen. And of course this is a very, very popular point of view. Will there be a rapture right away? Is it coming in our time and generation? Will we all be carried into heaven? The viewpoint that argues that this will soon happen, and that we can see this from the signs of the times, and that there will be a tremendous rapture of the saints that could happen at any moment, is generally known as dispensational millenarianism. Wow, what a mouthful. Let's just break it down. It's not a hard thing to talk about. Although the subject of Bible prophecy can be detailed and involved. Let me say it's not hard to comprehend. It's just there's a lot of information. So we will do our best to break up the information into digestible segments. The word dispensational has to do with the dispensations or dealings of God with men. Generally, we could also use the synonym economy, God's different economies, how he administers his will to others and what he expects of men. We speak of three dispensations, the patriarchal, the mosaic, and the Christian age. But dispensationalism, as it's elaborated today, holds that there are in fact seven dispensations. That they correspond to the days of the creation week, as outlined in the book of Genesis. But they refer to eons of time. Many of the more conservative fundamentalists among them say that the dispensations last about a thousand years each. So you have six thousand years of world history. From this point, or from the time of the creation to this point, what does that mean? Well, we're right on the verge. The seventh dispensation is about to happen. Now, when you wed this idea with millenarianism, which is the belief in the coming millennium, you have the hybrid view, which exists so prominent in our time. Of course, millennial means thousand years, uh, and it's found in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, as we will discuss in some detail later. But suffice it to say, from this one reference to a thousand-year reign of Christ upon uh, earth, it is alleged by those who view this, then the whole idea of millenarianism comes into being. It's very commonly taught. But it's been around a long time. It is popular in our era, but it goes back even to the early church, but not to the days of the apostles. Back in the early days, it was known as chiliasm, which comes from the Greek word for thousand in the idea of a thousand years. Actually, the whole concept had its roots in Judaism where if you look at some of the uninspired documents that came out in between the periods when Malachi the last inspired prophet wrote and the beginning of the age that's the church age as we say roughly beginning with the gospel accounts in that 400 year stretch there were a lot of pieces of literature that came out not by inspiration and some of them dealt with what they call apocalyptic beliefs belief in a physical messianic kingdom the Jews had looked over the theocracy that was once theirs, the great kingdom, for example, under David. And they longed for the days like David when they would be in control over a great deal of territory and have a great deal of hegemony in the world, sway and power over peoples around them, they even cultural influences on others. And that had not happened in such a long period. They thought, well, when the Messiah comes, he will restore the kingdom in that physical sense. Then after the days of Christianity had begun, into the second and third centuries, there were those among the Gnostics, for example, it is held one prominent one, Serenthus, had believed in the idea of chiliasm, millenarianism. Uh, 
also the Montanists who came about in the later 2nd century, the so-called New Prophecy Movement. Those who misunderstood the close of the New Testament era had occurred with the death of the last apostle and the death of the last person upon whom apostle had laid his hands. When they failed to recognize that principle, they began claiming to have all kinds of charismatic gifts and named after their leader from Phrygia, Montanus. This idea took off and was a heresy found throughout the ancient church for a long period of time. And they pushed ideas of chiliasm as well as a number of the so-called church fathers. We find some evidence of uh, millenarianism being taught also in more recent works, such as in our colonial past, in the history of our nation, the famous Jonathan Edwards, the sinners in the hand of an angry God preacher, as you recall that sermon, pushed this idea somewhat, as well as the brothers Increase and Cotton Mather and several others. In the 19th century, a group in England known as the Plymouth Brethren were really known for the ideas of millenarianism. Now let me add this. When we talk about pre-millennialism, we're referring to the theory that Christ will return for the second time prior to the millennium. So it's called pre-millennialism. And there are in the history of uh, thinkers in Christendom those who have said it will come after the millennium. There will be a millennium first and then Christ will return post-millennialism. And then the third major option is the one that we will be defending, actually, which is called amillennialism, from the alpha privative in the Greek language, which makes a word negative, no millennium. So we're saying there will be no literal, physical millennium. So those are the three basic views. But the Plymouth Brethren had an influence on one of their own, John Nelson Darby, who popularized these ideas and brought them to North America. And eventually these ideas worked their way into the tremendously successful Schofield Study Bible. Those are still available. It came out in the early part of the 20th century with a number of notes in the text that would explain the meaning of prophecies. And the problem was it did so from the millenarian dispensational point of view. So dispensationalism was really brought into the American psyche along about that period of time from the Study Bible and has had so much influence it is unbelievable. Today... I would say that the majority of Protestant, at least the conservative Protestant churches, are characterized by premillennial belief, dispensational uh, premillennialism, though not all, but many are. And you know, today it seems those who are fundamentalists or who are Bible believers think that you have to equate belief in the inspiration of the Bible, trusting the Bible as the literal word of God with millenarianism. They think those two things are the same. That if you don't accept the premillennial point of view, then you don't see that the Bible is the literal word of God. And they tried to lump us in with those who would deny so many clear teachings of an historical nature in Scripture. Not recognizing that when Scripture intends to speak figuratively, it should be thus taken. And that when it intends to speak literally, we should so see it. They fail to make these distinctions, and this is where so much of the issue revolves uh, around today. In the 1970s, I recall very vividly, as many of you still remember, we still hear about him, he's been on television a lot, the ideas of premillennialism were popularized by this prophecy professional, Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey was an extremely brilliant writer. I read his late Great Planet Earth just again the other day. It's an easy read, quite interesting. I mean, he just had a knack for words. He keeps you spellbound when you read his book. He was even a pretty good Bible scholar. Uh, with some impressive credentials from Dallas Theological Seminary. That ought to cue you in right there to the fact that he will be premillennial. Dallas Theological Seminary is generally a hotbed of premillennial beliefs. And he spread abroad these ideas so much that over 10 million copies of his book were sold. The most successful ever. He's known as the father of modern day prophecy, of the prophetic movement of our time. You cannot discount the role of Hal Lindsey in promoting these ideas made into books and, and movies. And in fact, Orson Welles, the, the great voice of the War of the Worlds in 1938, narrated the great, the late great planet Earth. So you can imagine how scary and how impressive that was. So this man has really done a tremendous job in spreading abroad these ideas in our culture. More recently, you have the works of Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, the Left Behind series. And look, there are at least what? One, two, three, four, five, at least 12 or more that have come out already, made into movies, if you can call them films. I tried to watch one left behind the first one yesterday. Um, 
with some quite well-known uh, author uh, or actors, rather, in my personal opinion, are not watchable. So amateurishly done. But many people are influenced by this sort of thing. And they believe it is actually happening the way they say that there are going to be so many who are left behind. People are afraid when they think about the coming rapture. And in the Left Behind series, uh, you have it uh, portrayed in this way. People instantaneously left their clothes and disappear into thin air. And this was the rapture of the church, as they say, as we will discuss momentarily. So many people have had fun with this idea. I understand that my nephew in Alabama, who is a professional firefighter, uh, was fooling around and scaring some of his friends. And he um, left some clothes like this lying on there. But you know they have places they stay, sleeping quarters at the firehouse, and scared to death one of his friends who had just been to watch one of these Left Behind series movies because he saw the boots and the, and the clothes lying on the bed, and, and he was startled out of his mind. <clears throat> I have nephews like that. I don't know where that comes from, that strain of monkeyism in the family. But, you know, it seriously, even Lindsay himself recognized this appeals to people. In the book, The Great, Great Planet Earth, the version that I have, it's a little paperback where he talks about the movie uh, version of the book. Uh, the author said, everybody enjoys a good scare. And that's what this is about, really. This vision lies at the roots of the late, great planet Earth. They, they themselves admitted about this sensationalism. So everybody's talking about it. Somebody thinks, well, that's just that group out. All those groups. No, it's been in the church. Around the turn of the 20th century, R.H. Bowl became a prominent spokesman of premillennial thinking. I recall when I was preaching in New Orleans that in one obscure part of New Orleans in the city, there's an old church building way out in the middle of the woods, as I recall, and there are a premillennial church of Christ, I think from the influence of Bowl, who established a number of congregations. Later on in the uh, 20th century also Robert Schenck was a very capable scholar and good debater really who debated their side the premillennial side and was willing to take on those of us who disagree and even those who don't accept wholeheartedly the whole theory I think have been much influenced by some of the peculiar terminology we hear today uh, we'll talk about the signs of the time we may talk about the rapture and use that terminology not knowing that in the English Bible that word is not really used and particularly not with the connotations that, that they give it in this theory. So we need to study premillennialism. What is it? There's a $64,000 question. And we're going to see that there are certain beliefs that many of them hold in common. But there are also so many varieties of prophetic interpretations in our time among the millenarians that you can't really put your finger on. It. It's just articulated in so many ways. In fact, some have estimated there are over 165 distinctly different millenarian theories. But we can just summarize so what the basic, the basic views are. We can put forward some of these ideas, but they won't necessarily be the views that everybody you know who's a premillennialist will, will hold in every single respect. This is what we must keep in mind. Where do they get these ideas? Well, basically... Millenarianism, dispensational millenarianism, is a misinterpretation of Bible prophecy. There are at least four major books that they rely upon. The last one mentioned is the most important for them today, the book of Revelation. But they go back to the, some of the prophecies of Isaiah, some of Ezekiel, and some of Daniel. Now this is not all they do. They'll go to Haggai and many other prophets to try to find material that supports their point of view. They'll go to Matthew chapter 24 in the New Testament called the Little Apocalypse where Jesus talks about the coming destruction of the world. And what does that mean? We'll study that. How do they view it? Well, they think it means the literal destruction of the world. And they twist these and they come up with these ideas. But what are the basic tenets of premillennialism? First and foremost, the idea is that when Christ first came to the world, the Messiah, he planned to set up an earthly kingdom, just like the Jews were looking for, a political monolith that would have control over all the nations and all the Gentiles would be subservient to the Jews. This was his purpose. The kingdom of God was going to be set up. But unexpectedly, the Jews to whom he came to make this offer of the kingdom rejected him as their Messiah. Now, some versions will outright say, God just didn't see that coming. So he had to go back and scrounge at the last minute and find a way 
to, sal to salvage the situation, as we will see, came up with the church as a stopgap measure. Not all will say it that way. How Lindsay tries to, he recognizes the weakness of their view here at this point, and he argues, no, the Lord knew all along that Jesus would be rejected. My question is, if he knew all along, and Jesus was coming to bring such a, a kingdom as that, how was the church established as a stopgap measure? How could it have been thwarted? If he had always planned to build such a kingdom, how could it have been stopped? Oh, but this was the idea. So it's kind of strange to many of us to think that the divine purposes would have been frustrated there at the very beginning. So since Christ was not able to set up that kind of literal kingdom at that time, then in order to have something to take his place or its place, he came up with the church. The church is an afterthought until one day he will return again. Technically, as we will see, for the third time to set up his kingdom. Now, some of them want to say it's the second time, but as we view their, their actual scheme, it will be the third time when he comes to begin the new kingdom. Since the world is getting worse and worse, we have to conclude Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. He's about to be here. Of course, with the, the advent of Y2K, the year 2000, it was such a, a fervor. Of, remember, I remember it well. Oh, we thought all the computers were going to go haywire, all the glitches, you know, that we just imagined that the whole world would fall apart when the year 2000 came, the, the, the third millennium, the beginning of, well, it didn't happen that way. And so uh, many have gone back to rethink their positions, but it's still the idea that the Lord is about to come. And when he does, he will come for the church. Now notice that preposition. Jesus is coming for the church, the rapture. Uh, the idea that you see uh, with the Left Behind series and, and uh, the, the sensationalism of our time. People will just disappear going to heaven. My father once commented, it seems a little bit unfair to the church comments for Christians who believe this not to report up front. Now when the rapture happens, I'm going to abandon my car instantly. So they ought to raise their rates a little bit, their premiums. It's just only fair if they think that's going to happen. And he was being facetious to make the point. They often will say this happens in conjunction with the first resurrection, that there will be saints to arise and go off to meet the Lord in the air at this period of time and to be with the Lord for seven years, whether in the air or whether in heaven. Some articulate that differently. While they are away after the rapture, men will still be upon the earth. There will be countless people here and a period of tribulation will begin such as the world has never seen before. The great tribulation will take place during that seven year great tribulation we can have two major uh, divisions first the three and a half year period when there will be a wholesale return of jews from around the world who are now scattered in the dispersion back to israel literal palestine they will return to their homeland all of them, and reestablish the old jewish worship at mount moriah of course, you know now the Dome of the Rock sits there. It's a Jewish, it's an Islamic mosque. And there is no Jewish temple. There's just a portion of a uh, part of the foundation nearby the temple known as the Wailing Wall. But they're going to rebuild the temple and institute the old sacrifices of animals and start that priesthood all over again. And the second half of that seven-year Great Tribulation period will come the Battle of Armageddon. How many of us have heard of that? Everybody. You hear of it constantly. There will be a great battle between the forces of good and evil. The Antichrist will lead a large force, military force, to fight many others. There are so many fanciful speculations. What was his name? Nikolai Carpathian, I think, in the Left Behind series. How clever. He was a Romanian. Grows up. This is sort of all like the, the devil child, sort of. Many reminded me. There have been so many of this genre that crop up on it. The devil child. He's, Rosemary's baby. All this sort of thing happens. So he comes into power and he rises to a prominence in the parliament in Romania. Romania. Why don't you say obscure country? Roman. Romania. Ah, I get it. Romania goes back to Rome. So he arises and Nikolai ends up, ends up being the great antichrist and he becomes the leader of the European Union. The ten nations of the European... Wait a minute. About 28. Sorry, <laughs> they missed that part. But how Lindsay thought there, there were just 10 at that time. Now there are many more in the European Union, but they kind of overlooked that fact. And the European Union would be led by the Antichrist and would fight all the other nations of the world. Lindsay made it up to date. 
He said, prophecy reads like to this morning's newspaper. And at the time, the Six Days War had just occurred between the Arabs and the Israelis in the latter part of the 60s. He was able to tie all that stuff in with his interpretation of Bible prophecy and to show that the Cold War had meaning because the Russians, who he considered to be God, the Northern Confederates, were going to come down and have the great battle within Palestine. There at the Mount of Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo, Jezreel in the land of Palestine. Har Megiddo, Har being the mountain of Megiddo. The blood will arise up to the horses' bridles. It will be spread abroad for miles and miles. A great Calvary battle, battle will ensue. And then Christ at the end of that seven year period will suddenly return with the raptured saints. He first came for them. Now he will come with them to establish his earthly kingdom. Christ will come to the earth and sit on the literal physical throne of David in the literal physical city of Jerusalem, in the literal nation state of Israel. And Christ and the Jews will rule over the entire world for a thousand years of peace and prosperity. Oh, there will still be death and dying, some of them say, but the curse will be removed. Animals will get along that normally fight with each other now. It's strange in their scenarios how they explain this. But at the end of the thousand years, there will be a short interval when Satan will be loose because he will have been bound all during the thousand year reign. And he will deceive the nations for a short time more and then he will finally be subdued forever, cast into the lake of fire, and the world will end and judgment will begin. Some say judgment even happening right here upon this earth. Christ will deliver the kingdom back to the Father, that physical kingdom. There are various divisions of this view. As I mentioned, there are over 165 varieties, but three major ones that we encounter around us here in our area are the pre-tribulational crowd as well as the mid-tribulational or the post. Now the pre-tribulational say just as we said, the classic version is Christ will come for the church and that's just prior to, the, that's just the beginning of the tribulation period, the seven year period. So Christ comes up prior to the tribulation. There are others who say right in the middle of it, about at the time of the three and a half year period, then the Rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation. And then those who say, no, a tribulation will begin before the millennium comes. And then Christ will return at the end of the tribulation. And that will be the post-tribulational viewpoint. So there are some variations. But the one you most often hear is the pre-tribulational point of view. We need to evaluate some of the basic tenets of this view. We'll not be able to cover all of this this morning. But we want to look at the first point they make and zero in on it, it is perhaps the most important. It's crucial. The idea that Christ came to establish an earthly kingdom but was frustrating in the beginning. This is the first major assumption that the kingdom was to be physical or earthly like the literal kingdom of David. It also assumes that his rejection by men was unforeseen. Although not all will say it quite like that. They try to throw a sock to the fact that the prophecies clearly show he would be rejected. Some do, but not all. This view assumes that the church is a temporary institution. It's just a substitute for the kingdom that was going to be set up or was postponed at that time. And it assumes, of course, that the kingdom is not yet in existence. Now, what do we need to do to demonstrate the folly of this view? And I believe, as I will demonstrate, that it is a dangerous point of view for several reasons. We have to show that first the kingdom was to be established during the days of the Roman Empire. <laughs> Not Romania, but the Roman, the actual literal Roman Empire. And that has ceased ages gone by. The kingdom was not intended to be a physical one. Never was intended to be. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, never intended to be material, but spiritual. We must show that God, of course, foreknew of Christ's rejection, and that the church had been eternally planned, was not a mere substitute or stopgap. And most importantly, and all these other things go with this last premise, that the kingdom is already in existence. And by doing this, we refute the basic tenet of premillennialism, the future kingdomism idea. And once you refute future kingdomism, the other things begin to fall like a house of cards, as we will see. So what we want to look at this evening, the Lord willing, 
is the question of when the kingdom was to come. We'll notice beginning at this point that it was announced to begin around the time of the ministry of Jesus. And with this precursor, John the baptizer, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We will notice that. But I again will reiterate as we'll see this evening, there are some severe dangers with millenarianism to individuals as well as to cultures at large. Some of you, there have been extensive studies done about politicians. Some politicians have actually allowed their politics to be influenced by Kiliasm. So much so that there could be a danger there. Those who would want to precipitate. By the way, this sort of thing is found across the board. As you know, in the Muslim community, many of you have heard this. Among both Sunnis and Shia Muslims, there's a belief that one day the great Mahdi will come. The 12th Imam. It's a sort of a Christ-like figure. Now the Shia, especially the Persians or Iranians, have this idea that he had already had lived and then he went into hiding. He's now hidden. He's so occulted. He's occulted from our eyes. Hiding in some mountain, but he's going to return. And the way they'll get him to return is some vast battle. You can call it Armageddon. You can just call it the greatest battle of all battles. The mother of all battles, I think, was Saddam's way of describing the tank battle that he lost. And when that happens, then the 12th Imam will suddenly appear. He will come with Jesus Christ. Jesus will return. How on earth? Well, as we've often pointed out, Islam is a Christian heresy. It's hard for us to imagine that, but it is a Christian heresy. And I do mean heresy. Islam did not come about in a vacuum. It's the result of hybrid views of Judaism, Christianity, and some native Arabic ideas. Arab ideas. So Christianity has spawned many daughters and Islam is one. And it believes Jesus will return with a great imam. The world will end. There are fundamentalist preachers who've run for president sometime who have similar ideas from the other side. They all see it converging on the great battle of Armageddon. Some have said there are maybe those who think it ought to be hastened. Put your finger on the trigger, on the button, the red button. Get it to go and let's get this done. Let's get it over with. Get the new millennium in. How scary to think that people's politics can be led about. But we'll see some more of that later on. This morning, we don't want to leave the picture in your mind of the dog who was tethered to the clothes lying on the ground and make you think that we're here to make fun of the biblical doctrine of the second coming. Nothing could be farther from our purpose. We want to teach what the Bible really says. There's going to be a great shout one day, the voice of the archangel, the trumpets will sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, not we'll come back again, we will ever be with the Lord in the way of going off to meet him in the air. That will be the end of time, the end of the world. And the point is, we should fear the possibility of being caught unprepared. Watch and be ready for it. In such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. He can come again. Is Jesus coming soon? I don't know. No one knows. Lindsay doesn't know. LaHaye doesn't know. No one knows. Only the Lord God Father knows. And when He returns, it will be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Are you ready? Have you been baptized to be prepared so that your soul will be clean and white and ready to meet Him in judgment? If you need to do that, we would urge you to do so this morning. If you need to get things right with God as a child of God who's wandered astray, we would urge you to make that right. Whatever it is, let it be known right now while together we stand and sing.